Me and Avery Place. There are many parts of Northern Australia where water, the essential survival resource, is sparse. Vast areas like the central and northwest desert regions. There, Aboriginal people have lived also for more than 40,000 years, but with much more difficulty than their contemporaries in more fertile areas. Spinifex deserts make up most of this part of the country. The Tanami Desert, 700 kilometres south of Darwin, in the Northern Territory, is typical. That's hot. It's got good reason to be too, because this is the arid zone. I reckon you could just about fry an egg on that bonnet. Most of the year, the temperatures around this area around about the 40 degree mark, if not higher. The temperature and the lack of rainfall has made the landscape like this. It's a bold with the spinifex clumps and of course the stunted anthills. That made it doubly difficult for the Aboriginal people to exist and subsist in this environment. They had to keep moving all the time, chasing the water, chasing the rainfall when it happened. There was one particular bloke I can think of, an anthropologist by the name of uh, Tyndall. And he did a bit of uh, figuring out and worked out that for this particular environment, the Aboriginal people required one person per 70 square miles to subsist. And that's a big, big slice of land when you think about it. One person for every 70 square miles. Because it took that much landscape to support one individual. See, the problem is, as you move around the place, the lack of water, it's got a lot of competition. That little water that remains in the rocks and crevices and around the creek lines, the animals are after it, the birds are after it, and if you're trying to live here, you're after it too. And you come up to it, and you find that it's probably all drunk out, and you've got to dig it deeper. And if there's none there, no matter how much food there might be around you, you've got to move on, chase that water all the time. I'm talking about competition with animals. It's the same with the food too. You move across to a bush and it might have half a dozen berries on it. And if you can get it before the birds do, so much the better. But if you're a bit slow, a bit late, you miss out too. And you've got to move on to the next bush. And it's a constantly moving program to subsist in this environment. In fact, I reckon this is probably the harshest environment to try and survive in. Fifty years ago, this land provided all the resources of the Walpuri people, but today most of them live in the nearby Aboriginal community of La Germanu, where European foods and medicines have largely replaced traditional resources. The Walpuri, like most other Australian Aboriginal groups, no longer have to hunt and gather, and their great skills of food gathering are being lost. Only a few of the Walpuri are able to help Les with his study, and they are mainly the older people. Cook him on the coal. Yeah. Yeah, make a Johnny cake out of him. Well, it's one of the acacias. I'm not entirely sure which one it is. Second. Mix him up with water. Water. Yeah. And the rock, leg that. Ah, grind him on that rock. Yeah. Yeah, grind him up. Yeah. Right, as I was saying, he's one of the acacias. I'm not quite sure which one it is because I've not encountered it before. But because of the mass of seed pods on it, obviously you grind up the seed pods and make a bit of a johnny cake out of it. Yeah. Then cook him on the hot coals and then you can eat him. Mm. Comparatively few of the desert plants are a source of food. And those that are often only produce their edible products after rainfall, which can be years apart. One common exception is an insect gall caused by chemical interaction between an insect and a species of eucalypt tree. This is a, uh, the result of an insect gall that's all, uh, I think it's uh, name is Cystococcus, which makes you laugh. But um, inside, what you quite often get, if it hasn't flown the coop, is in fact a grub. There it is. And that grub's edible, raw, fairly high degree of moisture in that grub. And it's got all the stuff here, which you can eat as well. Additionally, 
Additionally, you can eat the, the white lining of the wooden gall. They're found growing on eucalypt trees right throughout the arid zone and other areas too in Australia. Knowledge and experience is essential in the eating of desert plant foods, as poisonous species do occur, even in the same plant group. The desert raisin is an example. These are part of the Solanum group, and you've got to be very careful when you pick them because the Solanums belong to the deadly nightshade group. So if you know, know what you're doing, you're okay, but if you're just pottering around experimenting, I wouldn't advise it. But these fellows here, are found right throughout the arid zones and the desert countries, right throughout Central Australia, but different species of them in different areas. These people here obviously know which species in this particular area are edible. And one of the key signs, in fact, if you look very, very closely at the, the seeds, you'll find little fine grains of sand sticking to them, and that's one of the indicators. Les's passengers often direct and set the mood for his field trips. Women from the larger Manu community especially enjoy them. The first stop is for the wild tomato, a desert fruit that's useful food, but only for the experienced. Well, this is again one of the Solanums. They're commonly called wild tomatoes in this part of the world. And as you can see by that reaction, they rather enjoy, Aboriginal people rather enjoy collecting them. In fact, they enjoy bush tucker trips, particularly like this, which makes my job a lot easier. Just back to the fruit. Unless you get rid of these black seeds that you can see inside, they're deadly poisonous. But once you've got rid of them, you can eat them raw. They do have a fairly bitter taste though and I'm not particularly fond of them myself. For those with the knowledge, many desert plants harbour more palatable, safer and nutritionally valuable foods. Still down there? Yes. Yeah. 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 See? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Is that root break off you stayed in the yeah, dam? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Hey, big one too. Listen, I'll just tell you what. Can you just hold him in your hand? No, I'll take a photo. Yeah, just like that. Just like that. That's it, one. Put him up this way. I'll get another one too. Well, what you're seeing here is an excellent example of the division of labour in Aboriginal society. It was the men's job to do the hunting, and the women, they had to go out and gather. In this particular case, what they're after are these things here. This is the witchetty grub. And I guess everyone that knows anything about Aboriginal survival techniques will recognise this fellow, or at least would have heard of him. They're found here in the roots of these little scrubby acacia trees. And the women are digging them up with their digging sticks, breaking open the roots and extracting the grubs out. Nutritionally, they're excellent. I think from memory they've got about 40% protein and about 30% fat and a bit of moisture as well. So you can't complain. You can eat them two ways. You can either fry them lightly on the hot coals, or secondly, you can eat them raw. Either way, they're quite delicious. In fact, they have a taste that's fairly rich. It's a bit like eating raw eggs and butter mixed up together. And I find that one or two is about enough. I've already had one, but I'll have another go to the second one. The animals of the desert are its greatest source of protein and traditionally the smaller creatures mainly were hunted by women. Burrows are much more easily found in burnt out regions. Aboriginal women have great respect for lizards, as often their capture can prove traumatic. Well, this is the blue tongue, and uh, it's one of the favoured foods in this part of the world, along with goanna. And what these ladies have been doing is walking around this burnt out area, 
looking for the, the burrows. This is one of them here, and that's how they came across this fella. He'll go into the pot later on this afternoon. But it reminds me of a rather funny story, a rather funny incident I had a few years ago, probably over Port Keatsway, I think it was, where a group of ladies like this were out chasing goannas one day. <laughs> and they found a hole, and they dug him up. <coughs> now goanna came out of the hole, and he looked around, and the first thing he saw were two skinny black legs in front of him, and he thought they were trees. So he ran straight up the lady's leg, <laughs> on top of her head, and she was running around everywhere with this goanna on her head, you yeah. know? So you've got to be very careful with goannas, <laughs> and blue tongues, of course, because they do scratch and they do climb up ladies' legs. <laughs> The bush tucker you've seen on this particular program is only a very, very small fractional representation of what we've got available here in Northern Australia. So far, we've catalogued about two or three hundred species, maybe even four. And I guess there's probably another 400 out there waiting to be catalogued. That'll take me another two years, I'd imagine. All of it, of course, has been done courtesy of Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal people. But for us in the military, it's got particular and special relevance, particularly here in the Australian continent because we've got units and organisations like SAS and North Forts who, in a wartime setting, would rely on these sort of resources to some extent to support them in the battlefield. Well, I suppose with another two years' work ahead of me, I'd better get going and stop talking to you lot. <laughs>